Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> sure is nice to see you. I'm um, always surprised when I get up here that there's more people here than I realized. I think some of you must sneak in at the last or something, but I'm so thankful to, to see you this morning. A couple of things uh, before we get started in our study today. Uh, you may have noticed on the overhead that we have a new addition to our official church family, and that is Marcus Howard, who is sitting right over there. And at the end of the service, we'll have him uh, stand at the back back here and go through the, the process of hugging and shaking hands with you, and you can welcome, welcome him warmly. And we're so thankful that uh, he came to us all the way from California. Can, is there anything good that can come out of California? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Notice it's coming out, right, brother? Okay, all right. <laughs> Second thing is next Sunday uh, we have another one of those eat and uh, ask uh, situations immediately after the uh, service and where you can bring your own food. We encourage you to do that except for the fact that uh, Randy McCulley says he's going to bring cornbread and chili next week. So. Uh, there are some of you that may accidentally forget to bring your own lunch. That's okay. Uh, he'll, he'll back you up. And, uh, uh, and anyway, that sounds, in fact, I'm hungry right now. <laughs> but uh, uh, secondly, with regard to that, uh, there was a hard question that was posed, and which question isn't hard, but out of Peter. And uh, it, it was one of those that was difficult to answer. Randy's going to deal with that. Uh, come this next eat and ask time. And so, and we, we don't discourage your, your hard questions, but we may not be able to answer them on the spot. But frankly, we like to be like Bereans. We want to search the Scriptures. And we do believe that iron sharpens iron. And so we encourage that, and uh, uh, we, we desire to know Him, as the plaque on the wall says in the Scriptures out of Philippians 3. Now with that, let me turn our attention to 1 Corinthians, and we're in chapter 7, and those of you that were here uh, last week know that we covered about the first six or seven verses right in there, and uh, some hard things that are in here, some technical things, and some the kind of things that yours truly would not uh, choose to talk about, but God chose them for me as we systematically go through the Word of God. So we continue in this new section that begin in chapter 7 and verse 1, and it has to do specifically with questions relating to marriage and to singleness. And Paul has, you might recall, providentially has just closed a rebuke in chapter 6 on immorality with the command to glorify God in your body, which is verse 6, 20. And the question then follows naturally and logically, what do we do with relationships, especially physical relationships, now that we are Christians? How are Christians to act? And someone could gather the mindset that if the physical activity in chapter 6 is immoral, which it is, is everything physically intimate in this fallen world tainted by sin and therefore to be shunned as Christians? How do we treat marriage in the midst of a world in bondage to sin and live as lights in the world? Sort of related thesis of this whole issue here. And overriding all the instructions is really what Paul said again at the end, how do Christians glorify God in their bodies? So, with that heavy-duty stuff and uh, what we're going to really be jumping in here with, here with both feet, let me ask the Lord's blessing again on our study together, please. Father, we thank you for your precious word. For those of us that know you, it is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. We see, Father, every 
page that we turn in your word that you are gracious and good and loving and kind unto us. You've given us everything that we need. We thank you, Father, who is like you. But every good gift comes from you, and especially the gift given, the greatest gift of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And we thank you, Father, for each other. We thank you that we can share lives together. And we thank you especially for the marriage bond. And we pray, Father, that we might glorify you in our marriages. Father, help me to speak today. Help me to get it right. Father, we need thee. We need thy spirit to guide and direct and to, to accomplish anything that's going to be accomplished here. And we ask these things in your holy and precious name, the name of Christ. Amen. I'm going to start, and you can turn there or not turn there, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, because I think it is all often important to go to this passage. And I believe that one of Satan's greatest weapons is to get us bogged down in our own distractions. And we can easily do that. We can do that with regard to our workplace. We can do that with regard to our hobbies and things that we enjoy doing. We can do that in our marriage and the problems with a family and so forth that can exist there can be a big deal. Notice what Paul says, and I'm, it's just a wonderful statement here in chapter 11 and verse 3 of 2 Corinthians. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. One of the things that we always need to understand and work through when we're caught in the, uh, uh, the quagmire of issues and problems of any sort is that God's on His throne. Jesus Christ is Lord. And everything revolves around Him and He's got it all under control. And we need to cut through the quagmire and see that. Simplicity. A purity. And that purity has to do with refinement. That Nothing would get in the way of my relationship to Christ. In fact, the things that go on in my life, as Romans 8, 28 says, He works all things together for good, have to do with really refining me so that I might be equipped to serve Him and ultimately that I might be involved in that process of sanctification to be more like Him that is so very important in our life. Now, the single or married relationship must not be a distraction. Shall I say that again? The single or married relationship must not be a distraction, but a source of benefit and help in the battle of sanctification, living to be more like Jesus Christ. Remember at the very beginning, as we looked at last week, that God said back in Genesis 2 that it is not good for man to be alone. He saw man's need and he meets man's need and he does so graciously and wonderfully and he said, I'll make a help meet suitable for him. And he, of course, created woman right out of man's own body. An amazing thing. And thus we had the institution of the family. And when I say that, I'm going to go back to, uh, to Professor McCulley's um, study of the law, and I often think of that statement by Christ when he was being criticized supposedly for breaking some laws or man-made laws or manufactured during that time built off the law of Moses. When Christ said, that man was not made for the law, but the law was made for man. 
Are you with me on that? Think about that, what that statement is saying. Well, I could say, forgive me if I'm stepping out of bounds here, based on Genesis, it was not good for man to be alone. Man was not made for marriage, but marriage was made for man. Y'all with me? That's very important to understand in that sense that we don't get the cart before the horse. Now we looked last time at verses 1 to 6, the suitability of marriage, and Paul is systematically addressing each of these issues. And the first question, even though we don't know the question, but by the answer we assume it was something like this, is it more spiritual not to marry? And the simple answer was no. <laughs> How could woman be made for man and it was not good for man to be alone and marriage not be right? There are considerations, he goes on to talk about, for both singleness in marriage in service to God. In marriage the union is spiritual and physical. There is mutual encouragement. There is mutual help. There is mutual support, both physically and spiritually, when the relationship is correct. And we saw last time that married partners should be in tune spiritually and physically to each other, such that the marriage is a benefit and blessing. The spiritual should go on, and the physical should go on. We also begin to look in verse 7 at the suitability of singleness, which went back really to verse 1 and the questions that had to do with is it more spiritual to be single. And Paul says the, follow, the following in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 7. He says, Yet I wish that all men were even as I myself, However, each man has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in this manner. I wish is passively inclined. It's not a command. It's not a press. It's not, there's no pressure associated. But he's talking about something from his own heart. And he will later explain down in verse 28 and 33 that the Christian is engaged in a war. You and I are engaged in a war for our soul and for the souls of others around us. Now, when you think about it in those terms as the apostle was thinking about it, there is a value to being single. Uh, it, it has to do with the fact that one can go off to war, as it were, unconnected, un, uh, as it were, with the responsibilities and issues at home pertaining to the spouse. And that's really what Paul is getting at here because the single person has advantage in service freedom in that regard. But he also says here that each person has his own gift from God. And here we learn that singleness and contentment in singleness is a gift from God, like everything else. It's the way He made us. And He doesn't make us all the same. And I think everybody here can vouch for that. That's how we identify each other. And when we get to know each other's personality, we know that we're different. Well, we're different all through. We may be people made in God's image, but we are all different. And if your giftedness is singleness, you should be content in that. And you're in good company with the Apostle Paul. But not everybody's that way. He says one in this manner and another in that manner. And what we are to do, whatever manner it is, falls back again to chapter 6, glorify God in your body. Glorify God in your time on the earth. Spend your life, if you're a single person, 
spend that as an advantage in that sense that a married person may not have in service to the Lord. If you're married, spend that as an advantage, as it were, the advantages of marriage in service to the Lord. Don't we often lose sight of that? We are naturally so selfish and so self-centered that we, even Christians, get to thinking that it's all about me, me, myself, and I. We're here to serve the Lord, and He's given us all kinds of advantages and benefits based on who we are, and that's the point here. In verse 8, he says something specifically addressing those eligible for marriage, as we see which follows down in verse 9. Notice what he says. But I say to the unmarried and to widows that it is good for them if they remain even as I. And again, that even as I has to do with singleness. Now, here's some heavy-duty stuff we're going to wander into here, a little bit technical, so bear with me, all right? We're going to have to do that. It says, I say to the unmarried and the widows. Now, we know who the widows are. Those are those that a husband or wife has died. And that is clearly dealt with, for example, in Romans chapter 7 in the first three verses, where Paul uses that as a type of freedom, uh, uh, where he's really talking about freedom from sin, freedom from the law, but he's using the picture of a marriage. That if one of the spouses dies, the widow, widower, can remarry. They're free from that marriage contract upon death. But who is the unmarried here? And that becomes an issue. And it really is two classes because unmarried has the word chi, which, has, which is an in between it. So it's not unmarried widows, which would be kind of a double entendre anyway. Are you with me so far? We know who the widows are, but who are the unmarried? Unmarried is the word agamos. Gamios is married, or marry, and the word used throughout Scripture for that. Ah, gamos, ah is negative, and it means un, unmarried. And thus we have agamos as the, as the name here. And it has, if you put it in the right context, it is leaning on something that was but not is. Now, like done or undone. Are you with me? Done or undone. It's used four times here in the New Testament and only here, agamos. If the unmarried was intended as those never married, let me say that that's not likely as Paul also classifies virgins, if you look down in verse 25, where he starts addressing questions concerning the ones that have never been married and never engaged in any kind of uh, uh, sexual activity. He says, Now concerning virgins, I have no command of the Lord, but I give an opinion as one who by the mercy of the Lord is trustworthy. So this becomes, as it looks like anyway, a separate category. And this is even more distinct down in verse 34. Notice it says there, His interests are, un are divided, the woman who is unmarried and the virgin. Again, two different categories are listed there side by side. So we have the unmarried, the widows, and the virgins. Verse 11 further gives clarity to this, for it says when we get there, but if she does leave, she must remain unmarried. And so we can conclude from the situation of the Christian woman who leaves her husband must remain unmarried, Agamas. In this context, it is a woman classified as single, not a virgin or a widow, 
via separation, a divorcee, in other words. Okay, what does this mean? Well, for now, it indicates there are some previously married, divorced, along with the widowed, that are eligible for marriage. And that is stated in the next verse, for we read in verse 9, connected to verse 8, but if they do not have self-control, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. As with verse 2, Paul brings in the giftedness of the person to be able to, to be single as key. If they do not have self-control, he says, let them marry. If they are so compelled to physical passion, he says, it is better to marry than to burn. If God has not provided, in other words, the giftedness of singleness, let them matter, marry. It's better to marry than to burn. And that word burn is used six times in the New Testament. It's a reference to literal fire or in Revelation chapter 3 verse 18, tried by fire. This is someone prone to be troubled by strong physical passions and desires. Burning and longing. And the physical aspects of our body are very powerful. Let's not Let's not kid ourselves. That's why there's so much proliferation of immorality in our nation and country. It's why so much money and so much time and energy is spent in that area. Which I might also add uh, doesn't help the Christian who's trying to walk in purity and holiness before God because this is constantly in front of them. And we are reminded Again, of God's words back in Genesis chapter 2, it's not good for man to be alone. This is not something that caught God by surprise. He's the one that created the physical. And He's the one that instituted sexuality. And He's the one that instituted the family. And so all of that is, is, a, is a blessing and beautiful and wonderful and fulfilling when it's done in the righteous way, when it's done in holiness unto the Lord. Now here is Paul talking in these terms very practically, very plain as the Bible is that marriage from the beginning was designed to fill a need. And that's really what he is speaking of here. Now I also want to say that Paul is not here excusing our poor behavior. He's not excusing lustful sinning as though the saying which went around a few years ago, some of you young people may have not heard it, but it was going around all over the place at the time, the devil made me do it. Do you remember that? Which was an excuse for bad behavior. Or I just can't help myself. Yes, you can. Paul is referring to here to positioning one's self in the best manner to serve and glorify God. And if you're leaning, you're bent, your construction uh, as a person is such that you have that longing and desire for fulfillment in regard to a marriage partner, then so prayerfully seek Him. But at the same time we say that, Look back at 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 12 again where Paul says at the end of that verse, I will not be mastered by anything. Now the only person that can say that is a Christian who has the power of the Holy Spirit. And let me just say that we have a responsibility in that area. Look forward with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and look at verse 24 and following. Very important passages for every Christian. Here is Paul liking his sanctification, his Christian walk and endeavor to be pleasing to God and to live for Him and to serve Him as, as, as someone engaged in an Olympic race. 
He says, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Now that's, I think that even applies back to what we're talking about here with regard to positioning ourselves in service to the Lord. Some is one thing and some is another. For some it's singleness, for others it's those that need to be married. And that's very important. There is often, though, friction between our personal longings and our accountability, isn't there? Wow. Heavy duty stuff. And Paul addresses that, I believe, here, because he says everyone who competes in the games exercises self control in all things. They don't go out to the pig stand and pig out <laughs> and, and then think they're going to go win, uh, win the marathon. They have to condition themselves as to what they eat, how much sleep they get, and they have to run umpteen gazillion miles every day and spend hours working out to condition themselves to run and fight the good fight to win the race. He says they do it to receive a perishable reef, but we are we an imperishable. Notice he says, therefore I run in such a way as not without aim, I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I discipline my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. The idea is I'm not going to be a hypocrite. I'm not going to tell you, this is what you ought to be doing, brother, but I'm doing something <laughs> the opposite of that at all. Paul made himself an example as a follower of Jesus Christ and said, you can follow me as I follow Jesus Christ. Now, the point that he's making here is, is that we are to make our bodies work on behalf of Christ. And in fact, in the same context, I uh, even thinking about that, going down a little further to chapter 10 and verse 6, we have the examples of those in the Old Testament, don't we? We have the example of David who failed with Bathsheba and brought all that misery upon himself. We also have the example that we looked at last time of Joseph. When Potiphar's wife tempted him, he said, How can I do this great evil and sin against my God? And he fled out of there. Those things are written as our examples so that we might in not incur the same disasters as those that have gone on before us. We're blessed in that regard. And in chapter 1 Corinthians 10, in, down in verse 13, we're also given a, a promise here that is very special to the Christian. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man, and God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond that which you are able. But with the temptation will provide the way of escape also that you'll be able to endure it. So the responsibility comes back to you and me. We can't sit there and say, well, the devil made me do it. No, he didn't. If you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit within you, and greater is he that is within you than he that is in the world. And let's keep that in mind, and let's serve Jesus Christ. Now back to our text, beginning in verse 10, Paul deals with the suitability of separation, and this is for Christian marriages. Now Paul addresses a question, a question regarding separation or divorce of married Christians with unmarried Christians, or unmarried, uh, I mean, excuse me, with non-Christians, get this right here in a minute, in verse 12. But alluded here is since becoming a Christian, the married Christians now think they can serve God better being single. Sort of what Paul was saying, I wish you were as I. Or that somehow maybe marriage is a less 
holy state than celibacy. But Paul is going to tell us here that Christians must think and act differently in regard to vows and relationships. Look forward to 7 verse 39. Notice what it says in 739, a wife, and that would also include a husband, is bound as long as her husband lives. But if her husband is dead, she is free to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. There is a binding nature, a lifelong commitment that is true, and the Christian's mindset ought to be focused and committed and dedicated. And when he stood in his vows before God at the marriage that he took pl that took place. And, I, and said, until death do me part, he meant death do me part. And there shouldn't be any other idea in anyone's mind. Christians must think and act differently in regard to vows and relationship. And that is the intention of marriage. You'll notice also he makes this funny little statement here in verse 10. But to the married I give instructions, not I, but the Lord. Well, he simply means by that that Christ taught this during his ministry. This is a repeat of that. Look with me at Matthew chapter 5. Let's go back there. This is what Christ taught. And we should immediately recognize, and this is also provided in the other synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, chapter 5, where that is located in the context. It's located in the context of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, if you recall, Christ is clarifying to his listeners what the real laws meant. And they were issues of the heart, not just the external. For example, if you go back to verse 27, you have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. But I say that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. There's much more to the law than just keeping the externals. And that's the same issue that he's dealing with when he's talking about divorce in verse 31. It was said, whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. So what are they doing? They're, they're looking at it, focusing on a piece of paper, a document as being something legal. They're not looking at the intent of it, of what is in the heart. It's what's in the heart that is the issue. And that's why a successful marriage is a bond spiritually and physically not to be broken to the glory of God. And Christ says... But I say that everyone who divorces his wife, except for the reason of unchastity, makes her commit adultery. Makes her commit adultery puts the woman who had few rights and limited ability in that day to even take care of herself. They didn't have half the workforce as women that day at all. A woman had to be attached to a man to even survive. And Christ is saying it puts the woman in a position of forced remarriage and thereby committing adultery. Now the whole point here is, is that frivolous divorce creates a chain reaction of sinful conditions. That's what Christ is saying. It doesn't make any difference how many pieces of paper somebody signs, and I'm not saying you shouldn't sign a piece of paper, but that was not, the issue here is an issue of the heart. Now, some of us here that are older remember the actor, actress Elizabeth Taylor. And I can remember sad jokes about how many times she got married, which I don't even know how many times it was, but it, you know, it was every year or so there was another husband in Hollywood, very beautiful woman etc., etc. Obviously, I don't think she knew the Lord Jesus. 
And, and the, the point here is, well, even what I read in the culture of Corinth, there were people that had been married 20 plus times. It was not uncommon at all. I suppose there's some folks like that today in America. And here Christ does make an exception statement, doesn't he? He says, except for reason of unchastity. And that means apparently that an unfaithful spouse can bring a just cause. All right, now, before some of you start throwing rotten tomatoes, keep in mind that marriage is mutual and not unilateral. Are you with me? It doesn't mean the innocent spouse should divorce, but at least we know in some sense that Christ is saying there's an exception to this, otherwise it would not be included. Now unfaithfulness in the Old Testament under the theocracy, when somebody was caught in adultery, guess what happened to them? They got put to death. That was the death penalty. If we did that in America, half the people, would, I guess, would be dead. I don't know. <laughs> now, this exception, and I'm going to get technical again, is controversially, controversially interpreted. And one of the reasons is the word unchastity, which is really uh, the word pornonia or the word for fornication. If you look across your page at, uh, if you're back in Corinthians, at chapter 6, verse 9, that word, do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor uh, adulterers, nor effeminate, and so forth, that word fornicators is the word pornonia. And it is a word used throughout the New Testament. Uh, and some are saying, that when Christ used that word with regard to marriage, that is so peculiar that Christ was referring to those not finally married, but those in the betrothal portion of the marriage which took place in that day. Now, however, look back at 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1. It is actually reported that there is pornonia among you, and pornonia of such a kind as does not exist even among the Gentiles, that someone has his father's wife. Now what is that? That's adultery and incest. And so that word pornonia, in fact the NASB and the other translations, most often translate it as immorality, or unfaithfulness. In fact, in Matthew 19, in the same passage, it's translated immorality. Other places it's translated unfaithfulness. Now, what is this betrothal period? The betrothal period was part of the marriage process. Back in that culture and day, it was a formal proceeding whereby the groom-to-be and their family made an arrangement with the bride's family, and there was money exchanged or gifts exchanged, uh, uh, a, an endowment exchanged. There was actually a payment made for the daughter, and there was a formal setting when she became betrothed, and that was a commitment to the groom-to-be. Now, if we go to Deuteronomy 22, I'm not going to get you to turn there, 23 and 24, we find that a girl that was betrothed to somebody, if somebody violated her, some man violated her, guess what happened to him? He was put to death. And the reason for that is because in the same verse, the betrothed girl is called the man's wife. Now, I will get you to turn to Matthew chapter 1, 
This is exactly what Joseph and Mary were involved in in Matthew chapter 1 when she became pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows, when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together. And of course, that is intimately. She was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And, but notice what it says in verse 19. And Joseph, her husband... And we cannot, in that regard, talk about this being equal to our engagement period today, is my point. Was a, being a righteous man, not wanting to disgrace her, notice who has the control. Mary had, and in effect, her responsibility or to her dad and her family had been taken away, and now she was the responsibility of Joseph, and that's why it says... He planned to send her away secretly. Now, my point is, is this was marriage. We don't do this anymore, but they were married. We can't, and, and I don't believe in the passage in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 31 and also Matthew 19 that when Christ was speaking to those Pharisees and Sadducees that were just shelling their marriages like they'd shell peas, and I'm getting tired of you, so I'm going to get a new Sally, or whatever it was in that sense, was just a matter of betrothal period. And so if it's not a matter of him speaking with regard to the betrothal period, it was a matter of marriage, so then also would be the exception. Okay. There are situations, and I said earlier, that marriage is mutual, not unilateral. And I've seen this any number of times and have had to deal with it uh, as a pastor and an elder. One spouse runs off with another person. There's no repentance, no desire for the abandoning spouse to reconcile. Divorce is forced, and the abandoning spouse remarries. And the first marriage is hopelessly destroyed. My friend, that's reality in the fallen world. And it, Christ, I think graciously here, has left room for such an exception. Now that's not where we end the story. Because when we get to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 11. Let's see what Paul also says here. Again, he's talking to Christians. Notice Paul says, but if she does leave. Now he's already said that the wife should not leave her husband, but if she does leave, and that's what I'm saying, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband and the husband should not divorce his wife. She's not eligible for remarriage, nor is he. In a mutual Christian marriage, where is the weight of responsibility? Are you fussing and fighting with your wife? Are you not getting along with your husband? Is there trouble brewing in the Christian home? Sometimes we just simply need to go back to Ephesians chapter 5 and reiterate, reiterate what the Scripture says about being submissive and loving as Christ loved the church. What is the Christian marriage supposed to be? A picture of the relationship between Christ and His church. We're to be lights in the world. We're not to be, how can we have a testimony of Jesus Christ when our family life is all tangled up and messed up and screwed up? Oh, my friend, the weight of responsibility here is on reconciliation because God took those commitments that were made as a binding commitment 
and responsibility. And so Paul declares as Christ that divorce for a Christian is sinful. And he commands the married couple not to divorce. Now this hasn't, uh, I don't know how much fun you've had, but I haven't had a lot of fun going through this. Uh, it's not my favorite subject, and I'm very thankful, and I'm not trying to brag on that. Uh, it's probably more Jan than me, but I don't have those kind of problems. But one of the things I would say to you, frankly, and I've seen this by experience over the years of being in the church, is that generally speaking, not always, but generally speaking, the people that are having the marriage problems are the ones that don't darken the church door enough. They're not the ones that are at the Bible study. They're not in God's Word. They're not thinking correctly because we need the continual intake and the influence and blessing of being in God's precious Word. That keeps us from wandering over here and wandering over there and thinking selfishly over here and selfishly over there. God help us. And, and marriage has to be worked at. You can't be a Act like a single guy or girl and be married. The blessing of marriage is so rich. God knew what he was doing. Nurture your marriage. Nurture your wife. Nurture your husband. Give thanks to God. Pray together. Uh, worship together. Read the scripture together. Have conversations together about Christ and about God. You won't have to worry about reconciliation then. I hope I'm making sense to you. You see, whether married or single, in closing, we are to live walking in the light. We determine our giftedness, single or married, and then use our circumstances to position ourselves to live for the glory of God of Jesus Christ. And all of these matters, by the way, are issues of the heart, just like Christ on the Sermon on the Mount, and issues of faithfulness. They are issues of faith to do what is right and to serve God. If your marriage is rocky, then seek God in prayer and seek to get it restored and get it back on good, solid ground there's not a greater blessing in this life than to have a wonderful marriage as far as I'm concerned. Now, for those of you that are single and gifted to be single, hallelujah, serve Christ as, your, as a single person. For all, we need to live beautifully in Christ and thank God for what He has given us and live to glorify His precious name. Let me bow in prayer, please. Father, we thank You for the instruction that You give us from Your precious and holy Word. We praise You for it. Father, help us to know the truth and help us to walk with You how I pray for all those that are here and the good marriages that are here. Oh, Father, bless them. And help them to serve you, whether single or married, and to use all to the glory of Jesus Christ. Thank you for how you created us, and thank you for all the provisions that you have given to us that we might serve you and be without excuse. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.